want to know one thing. Is it time to finish the work? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful, Lord, for what our ears are hearing, what our eyes are seeing. We're thankful, Lord, for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in this place. We feel, Lord, that you're leading us, you're guiding us, and you're directing us. Lord, we ask that our continued presence now to be with us as we continue to study your word. As we continue, Lord, to be solidified in this precious truth. We thank you, Lord, for all that's done for us and all that you will do for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe it's coming clear, brothers and sisters. It's coming clear to me that I've ever had to come clear, and I've studied it, and, but just the Lord has just done something very special uh, for these meetings. If I can get some, get, my, get them hooked me up there. <laughs> the Lord has just done something very special for these meetings that uh, I haven't seen. Just, the Lord has not made it so plain uh, as he has made it uh, for us during this done these done these sessions. Satan is working with everything he has to prevent us as a people from understanding what has to be done. And I believe that you see more than ever before that you need to leave this place on fire for the Lord. We have a work to do. And I want to say again Let's pray, let's solidify ourselves, let's band together. This is an upper room experience. Let's, let's, let's think on these things, let's, let's put it on paper, let's decide let's, what we need from one another that you would need to make this thing successful for you. And I want you to continue to do that. We want to put all this together. Some of, most, a lot of you are saying we need manuals. And we, we'll, we'll work on manuals. Uh, some say I need PowerPoint, some of these PowerPoint slides. We will, we'll work on getting that. Whatever it's going to take to make this successful. Do you see, saints, that it, we have to do this? And I mean, it's just not an option anymore. I mean, the time is so very, very short, saints. It's very, very short. And I believe it's such a time as this as God is making it plain for us. Looking back at our screen now, what do we have there? We have a beating heart. That heart pumps blood to every pillow of our faith. If Satan can stop that heart, brothers and sisters, he will stop this message. In this session, we're going to see that he has almost successfully, completely stopped that heart. And it's history. It's prophecy right before our very eyes, saints. We need to move forward hastily. And I want to take us on a little history journey. I, I can't do it as, as extensively as I had planned to do it because time just will not permit us to, to do it to that, that extensively. By the way, that, that, that slide right there will be one of those that you will get. So I see some of you trying to write that down. We'll give you one of those slides. You'll get one of those slides. We want to move forward. We want to back up in our history. You know, in 1844, when we saw, when we saw the sanctuary in heaven and and she says that it opened to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary. The pioneers of this faith began to lay down all the pillars. And by 1888, God gave us the found pillar. And of course, we know the story of what happened in 1888, that um, the church rejected the 1888 message. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that hopefully a little later. But right after the 1888 message, brothers and sisters, a man by the name of Kellogg was coming on, coming on the scene. The prophet says, the indifference with which the help books have been treated by many is an offense to God. To separate the help work from the great body of the work is not in his order. What does that say, saints? To separate the what? From the, is not, is not in his order. Present truth lies in the work of help reform as well as in other features of gospel work. No one branch, listen to this, no one branch when what? 
can be a perfect whole. Brothers and sisters, the three angels' messages consist of not only the gospel work, but it consists of the medical work as first. The first angel takes us into what? A most holy place experience. And when you go into that most holy place experience, brothers and sisters, on the Day of Atonement, things change. Your dress change. Your diet change. Everything changes because it is the Day of Atonement. It is a time of coming on one, at an anointment with God. So everything changes. So what Satan wanted to do first was he must separate the medical work from the work of the ministry. That was the first thing he had to do. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? That's what she says. And he did. Medical missionary workers in no case to be divorced from the gospel ministry. The Lord has specified that the two shall be as closely connected as the arm is with the body. Without this union, neither part of the work is complete. So we see now in doing this reason, saints, the prophet says, teach the people to preserve their health and increase their strength by avoiding the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic influence. By precept and example, make it plain that the food God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for our use as we seek to regain that sinless state. Brothers and sisters, that means there were no Kentucky Fried Chicken in the Garden of Eden. KFC, continue, killing folks continuing. No murder burgers. None of us in the Garden of Eden, brothers and sisters. God is leading us back to the diet originally given to us, brothers and sisters. And God never, you know, when, when God actually even allowed man to eat meat, he never allowed him to eat meat with blood in it. We have never been allowed to eat meat with blood in it. Never! It has always been a sin because the life is in the blood. And when you eat the flesh of the blood, you take on the nature of the animal in which you're eating. The only way we were ever able to eat it was without the blood. And when you take the blood out, you don't want it. It's kosher. It tastes like leather. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? You can never go down to Kroger and get no meat to eat. Never. Are you with me? Not a supermarket around that you can go and get it. But she says, Without the, the union, neither part of the work is complete. The medical missionary work is the gospel in illustration. Now we know in 1908, Kellogg was able to arrest the sanitarium from the church. And you know what, saints? It has never been brought back. It has never been brought back. And so we have been working with the right arm behind our, our, our back ever since. Look at this thing. Now listen to this. This is very important. Let me show you what's, what has happened. But God did not design that the medical missionary work should eclipse the work of the third angel's message. All of our medical facilities since then has been separated from the gospel work. The, the institutions that have been developed have not been developed on the line that God wanted them to be, be, be developed on. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying here, saying? So, God did not design that the medical missionary work should eclipse the work of the third angel's message. The arm is not to become the body. The third angel's message is the gospel message for these last days, and in no case is it to be overshadowed by other interests and made to appear an unessential consideration. When in our institutions anything is placed above the third angel's message, the gospel is not there, the great leading power. So you see, saints, as we do this thing, you see we, we have to bring the, the two of these together. We, do we see this, saints? This is the work. Both of them have to work harmoniously together. Satan does not want that. When you bring them both together, brothers and sisters, then we have a true message, the true three angels' message. We're going to see some here in this, in, this, in this thing. Now, we know that Kellogg was the one that brought in the, what, we, what do we call it? The Alpha. Let's, let's, now, look at what the prophet says. Satan has thrown us off on this Alpha apostle. Look what the prophet said. She said, dear fellow workers, I am awakened at 11 o'clock. The representations passing before me are so vivid that I cannot sleep. 
the word of the Lord has come to me that there is a decided work to be done in warning our medical missionaries against the dangers and pearls that surround them. So she's saying the medical missionaries need to be warned. Look what she, let's, let's continue what else she said. She says, the Lord calls upon those connected with our sanitariums to reach a higher standard. No lie is of the truth. That was something floating around. Satan was working. He was, he was trying to do what he could to separate the two from the girl. So he brought in a virus into the sanitarium work. Look what else she says. The Lord calls upon those connected with our sanitarium to reach a higher standard. No lies of the truth. If we follow cunningly devised fables, we unite with the enemy's forces against God and Christ. God calls upon those who have been wearing a yoke of human manufacture to break this yoke and no longer be the bond servants of men. There, the, the, the medical missionaries of that time were listening to what Kellogg was saying. That's a long story here. No, I can't get into all the details because we just don't have time. Look what she says now. Look at this next statement. Look at what the prophet says. The bow is on. Satan and his angels are working with all deceivingness of unrighteousness. They are untiring in their efforts to draw souls away from the truth, away from righteousness, to spread run throughout the universe. They work with marvelous industry to furnish a multitude of deceptions to take souls captive. Their efforts are unceasing. The enemy is ever seeking to lead souls into infidelity and skepticism. He would do away with God and with Christ who was made, uh, listen to what this woman is saying. This woman was a prophet. Who was made what? That woman didn't put that in there just for any reason. Who was made flesh and dwelt among us to teach us that in obedience to God's will, we may be what? Victorious over sin. Now look at now, she's talking about the Alpha. So there was something in the Alpha that was teaching us that didn't, we didn't even need to worry about having victory over sin. This is what she's addressing. This is the first page in the in, 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 in first selected message. Look what she said. So I underlined, the bell is on. What is it on over? The bell is on over victory, over sin. So in the very alpha of apostasy, the issue was victory over sin. Now what did Kellogg bring in? Kellogg brought in, we, we, we always call it, name it, pantheism. But we want to see, we want to look behind the scene and see what was exactly pantheism. The hope of glory is what? Christ in us. What does pantheism say? Christ is in everything. So what do you need? You know, it's in, you already have it. You are a demon God. He's in you already. So you don't need to worry about that. So if he's already in you, you don't need to worry about no intercessory, no prayer, no, 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 no sanctuary in that, do you? Because he's already in you. He's in everything, the prophet says. Victory over sin. It's over victory over sin. Look at the prophet says now. She says, I have been instructed by the heavenly messengers. I like this. I have been instructed by the heavenly messengers that some of the reasoning in the book Living Temple is unsound and that this reasoning will lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth. Look what she says. All through the book of passages of scripture, these scriptures are brought in in such a way that error is made to appear as truth. Erroneous theories are presented in so pleasing a way that unless care is taken, many will be misled. Look, look here. People were falling like flies under the influence of this book. The medical missionaries was, was being bamboozled. They were being bamboozled to the point, brothers and sisters, that they broke off from the church and followed this man. Even the people that God used to bring in Russians by faith, even one of them was bamboozled, brothers and sisters. Are you with me? So, but this was the alpha of apostasy, and this alpha of apostasy was designed to get rid of the idea that you need to have victory over sin. Saints, all the way through from the very beginning, the issue has been victory over sin. 
When the, so, brothers and sisters, when, when the Bible says he went to make war with the remnant of the sea, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, it's always been about getting rid of the idea that you can have victory over sin. This is always the issue. From the very beginning, the Bible says, look, here are they that keep the commandments of God. We read that, and for some reason, it's been floating over our head. Well, what does that mean? But just keep the Sabbath again. No, brothers and sisters, this is victory over sin. Let's continue. So she says, my message to you is, no longer consent to listen without protest to the reversion of the truth. Unmasked pretentious sorcery, which if received will lead ministers and physicians and medical missionary workers to ignore the truth. Everyone is now to stand on his guard. God calls upon men and women to take their stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel. I have been instructed to warn our people for many are in danger of receiving theories and sorceries that undermine, look what she says, saints, that does what? Undermine the foundation pillars of the faith. Now, saints, this is the alpha. This is history. This has passed. What we want to deal with is the omega. But we, in order to fully understand the omega, we must first understand the alpha. Are you with me, saints? What was the alpha about? It was about victory over sin. It used a vehicle of pantheism, but it was about victory over sin. The alpha of apostles, pantheism, that was the vehicle. But, brothers and sisters, it was about getting rid of that right there. It's always about getting rid of that right there. Getting rid of the sanctuary. Getting rid of that truth. That's what it's all about. That's just what Satan's game plan is, to get rid of that precious truth right there. The omega would be of a most startling nature, the prophet says. The omega would be of a most startling nature. Now, look what she said. Look at this thing, son. She says, the Lord told her in a dream that she saw an iceberg and she was told to do what? Meet it. Now, you know an iceberg, the largest part of it is underwater. So the alpha is there. But look at the omega. And she says that the omega would be of a most startling nature. But now remember now, the omega is the last part of the alpha. It's the same thing. It's the same reception. It's just the end of it. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now the prophet said it was going to be. Do you believe the prophet? All right, let's go. She says, living temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the omega would follow in a little while, and I tremble for our people. The prophet says, I tremble for our people. She was scared. All right, let's look at this thing. How did the alpha come to us? Through the medicals and physicians. Have the medical and and the physicians ever came back together with the ministry? No. Have not. So then, how, where would the omega come from? Who's left? Huh? The pastoral of the ministry. That's the only way it can come. Are you following me, brothers and sisters? It has to come through the ministry. Are you following me, saints? Let's go. What would Satan lead men to do through the Omega of Apostasy? And I'm going to tell you some saints that the Omega is way bigger than the Alpha. Way bigger. Just like that iceberg is way bigger than the Alpha. That's what the prophet says for the, for the Omega. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among seven-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in what? Giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith 
and engaging in a process of reorganization. So the omega, the enemy, who is the enemy? Satan. Satan. So he would bring in the idea that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Have we already looked at the pillars of our faith, saints? We've already looked at them, right? We know what they are, right? What's the central pillar? The sanctuary, brothers and sisters. What, 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 what did the prophet say? The passing of the time in 1844 opened to our astonished eyes what? The cleansing of the sanctuary. So what have we discovered, brothers and sisters? That the pioneers began to build their pillars on the fact that there was a sanctuary in heaven, that Christ had left the holy and went into the most holy place, and that we must have victory over sin. Is that right, saints? Is that what we've learned? So, but she says the enemy of souls are sought to bring in a supposition that a great reformation was to take place among us and that it would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Are you with me, saying? Are we ready to study? Let's go. Question. What are the doctrines that stand as the pillars of our faith? And where did they come from? We know where they came from, don't we? We already know that. What are the doctrines that stand as the pillars of our faith and where did they come from? Now, let's watch and see. She goes on now to explain. She goes on to break this down. Now, this is First Selected Measures 204 and 205. Look at what she says now. She says, were this reformation to take place, what would result? Now, this is what she's, she's looking for. She says, were this reformation to take place? Now, the enemy of souls are sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place. Now, remember I told you earlier that the demographics of this country has changed, right? And the demographics of our church has changed. So she says, were this reformation to take place, what would be the result? Let's, let's see what she says would be the result. First, number one, what would happen? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Listen to this thing, brothers and sisters. Number one, the principles, and this is in first selected message 204, 205, so you really, you really don't have to write them down. They're there. But number one, the principles of truth that God has given us, the principles would be discarded. Number two, our religion would be changed. Number three, the fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Number four, a new organization would be established. Number five, books of a new order would be written. Number six, a system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm, it, I'm trembling in my boots to know how accurate this woman was. Because each and every one of these things have been fulfilled to the very letter. She says, were this reformation to take place, what would be the result? So the reformation has taken place, and there is the result of what she said. Look, now look at this new organization. Look what happens. She says, the founders of this system would do what? And do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. I tell people all the time, stop fighting this movement. You, nothing would be able to, look, the prophet says you will see the Russian torment of iniquity in the church and be powerless to do anything about it. So stop fighting it. It's time for guerrilla warfare. Let's say time to go to those who want to hear. Stop wasting your energy. Look, uh, I never forget a pastor to tell me, he said, look, ripe fruit will fall from the tree. Stop trying to shake hard, unripe fruit from a tree. You're shaking the tree. Look, read this book. Look at this DVD. Leave them alone. Go to someone that want to hear the truth. So I tell you, when you leave here, brothers and sisters, don't go back and broadcast this stuff. Don't do this. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. She says they would go into the cities and, listen, saints, right now, 
we are going out on Sabbath. Our churches are going out and doing community work on the Sabbath. Now we're supposed to be doing what Christ did. He did good on the Sabbath. Churches are closing down, going out painting buildings and building houses and cutting grass on the Sabbath as the means of talking about showing that we are Christians. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Block parties on the Sabbath and all this kind of stuff. Desecrating the Sabbath. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Look what she says. Let's read that. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. But God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Oh, they teach that virtue is better than vice. Oh, yes, we should be nice. We should be good. But when can we be good and in of ourselves? Jesus says there is none good but the Father. Our only hope of being good is through Jesus Christ. That's it. Other than that, saints, we're hopeless. So the prophet has prophesied what the Omega would look like. Do we see it, saints? Now let's see if indeed we are in the Omega. And remember, Satan wants to stop that heart from beating. Are you with me, saints? Let's move. There are 1,200 statements by the pioneers of our church and by Ellen G. White that tells us that Jesus came in the fallen human nature. 1,200 statements. 800 by the pioneers, 400 by Ellen G. White herself. 1,200 statements. Now, do you understand the significance of why that's important? To know that Christ came in the nature of Adam after the fall versus before the fall. Do we know? Let me see the hands of those that understand the significance of that. Most hands out in there. Not everybody, but most hands. That's enough hands for me to continue. Maybe you, you can talk to those that don't know. All right? From 1852 to 1952, that's what we taught. You see that, saints? That's the, that's, that's, the doc, that's the doctrine that we taught. You know who that man is right there? All right, see, one person knows who they're doing. Anybody? Let me see the hands of those that know who that man is right there. Uh-huh, everybody in here don't know, and that's exactly right. Everybody in here don't know because this man has been demon, he's been demonized. The, the book that I raised up earlier on that most of you, a lot of you got, is he wrote that book, M.L. Andreessen. All right, let's who, see who is M.L. Andreessen. Well, first of all, before we see who he is, we got to do this right. I didn't miss nothing. I hope not. Let me see. No, I did. All right. As Brother Davis showed you before, he showed you the generations. Did he not? And now you understand that the fourth generation will not come into effect until when? 20, 2024. They will become what? In 2024. They will become the movers and shakers in this church. They will begin to be the, 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 the leaders of this church. They will become superintendents and deacons and elders, and they will be going off to school and coming back and being pastors and administrators and what have you in this church by 2024. But we found out something about that fourth generation, didn't we? What did we find out about that fourth generation? Come on now. I, you were very excited now. What did we find out about the fourth generation? That's the limit. That's the limit. That's the limit. It can be the limit for bad or the limit for good, right? If you follow it on to do right, it has a good connotation. But if you have not done what's right, it has a bad connotation, doesn't it? So if we have left what God gave us in the first generation, brothers and sisters, and have been apostatized and moving away, and we have been, and we, if we have embraced that omega apostasy, then, brothers and sisters, then that fourth generation means some bad things are going to take place. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? All right, let's look. Let's go. Let's go. The prophet says, Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of his power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. He's been seeking gradually over the years. And I wish I had time to go through the, the gradual process that he have used to, to give us to, to it's been a sneaky, uh, subtle, uh, serpent-like way of eroding the principles that God gave us when 
when, the, when Kellogg took and snatched the sanitarium away from us, away from us in 1908, the prophet had already, God had already given her instructions to find another place out in California in 1905. She says because the sanitarium is going to be taken from us. So in 1908, when it was actually taken, God had already raised up CME, which was uh, the uh, medical missionary, which is now called Loma Linda, by the way, to do the work that the sanitarium was going, was what had, what had failed to do, it had been taken from us. But Satan set upon uh, Loma Linda right from the Jump Street. And so, and so until about 1911, 1912, we made a bad decision. And I'll tell you some things. Was Adam a bad person? Did he do a bad thing? Brothers and sisters, as I look back at our leaders, many leaders were good people. They simply were deceived. They simply made bad decisions. They simply decided not to follow the counsel that God gave them. When we don't follow the counsel that God gives us saints, we're going to get in trouble. So I look back at many of these men. Many of these men were simply bamboozled. They were simply, they looked around them and still, they just, we can't take the land. That's the, that, that's the conclusion they came to. And so what happened at Loma Linda? They decided we cannot operate this institution unless we let this, do what the state says do. And at the time when we decided to become accredited at Loma Linda, at that time, the state of California recognized natural healings as well as uh, drug related. Therapy. We could have went the way that God wanted us to do, but we decided we wanted to match our wits with the world. And we agreed to allow accreditation to come into Loma Linda in 1911. And then Satan, once Satan got us to do that, and God, the prophet already told us, never! She says, if you seek the education that the world esteems so highly, you will lead further and further from the, from the principles of truth until you become educated world. And she says, at what a price have you acquired your education? You have parted with the Holy Spirit of God. She says, I speak to you definitely, this must not be done. But we did. So when we uh, allowed Loma Linda to become accredited, then the AMA came in and said, all right, now we had all the schools. But the AMA said, you can no longer, after a period of time, you can no longer send students from your non-accredited institutions over to Loma Linda, which is an accredited institution. The only way you're going to be able to send students over there is that you must accredit the institutions from which these students are coming from. You see, we put, was put in a vice. That's what Satan does. You step off and then Satan puts you in a vice. And so we, 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 we went back and forth with that until finally, brothers and sisters, in 1931, we accredited three of our, more of our schools in order to send these students because what was, what was happening? Students were leaving our schools and going to the world of schools to get their degrees and then come to Loma Linda. Are you following me what I'm saying, Saints? So we ended up in, because the students were going to the world, we ended up having to accredit our schools so that we could get our schools, to get our kids to stay in our schools and then go to Loma Linda. And once we did that in 1931, 1931, Saints, it was over. By 1935, we recognized that we had made a serious mistake. As a matter of fact, L.H. H. Walter said, cried aloud and said, we have made a mistake. We are sending our kids to hell in three of our schools, talking about the ones that they had just accredited. By 1940, saints, all of our schools were accredited. All right, now look at Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of the power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. So he got into the, what have we learned about the education system, saints? If he can get in through there, it's over. Listen, brothers and sisters, this new manifestation of satanic power that came out of the French Revolution to make open a vowed war upon the word of God was a false educational system, brothers and sisters. It has walked its way into our schools, brothers and sisters. Now we are victims of it. That is what caused America to take prayer out of school in 1962. It was because of the educational system. Anybody ever heard of John Dewey? 
I wish we had time to deal with John Dewey here today and the Humanist Manifesto. Brothers and sisters, we bought into that. Look here. Satan has been seeking gradually to rob this message of the power that the people may not be prepared to stand in the day of the Lord. That's our first generation. You heard Brother David say in our first generation, God gave us everything. Did you hear that? That's our fourth generation. And that's our fifth generation. Brothers and sisters, now tell me, what did God give us in the first generation that started this whole thing? What did he give us, saints? I uh, hear the three angels' message. It's true. I heard the sanctuary message. It's true. I want you to break it on down some more. He, what, what did he tell us, Brother Garrison? Victory Brother Nigel, I mean? Victory over sin. Victory over sin. Did, do we all agree with that? Do we all agree that it was... In, that in the first generation, God gave us the doctrine of victory over sin. Where did it come from? The sanctuary. What? Let me, I'm going to pump you a little bit more. I'm going to make sure you got this. How do we know that it comes from the sanctuary? Huh? I mean, what's, what's going on in the sanctuary to let us know that we had to have victory over sin. What happened in 1844? Jesus went from the holy to the most holy to start the day of atonement, our, our judging. It began with the dead. So we know this. Now, that's that heart that's beating. If we give up that doctrine, what does what, that mean? You are dead. If you give up that doctrine, brothers and sisters, did you hear Brother David said earlier about being dead? If you give up that doctrine, then the heart stops beating. Are you with me, saints? Look what she says. Divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. Atonement, incarnation. Christ came to make us what? Partakers of the divine nature. Come on, let's say it out together. And his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin the brother here the other day directed us to John 1 John 3 9 what does it say we cannot sin why because his seed remains in us and we cannot sin you know what this stuff has been there all the time and we have been bamboozled with scholarship to not believe it this simple True, been right there in the word of God, and we've been the poor, ignorant people who are, knew not the scriptures. Because the scholars say, oh no, you will be sent to Jesus come. Look at this thing, saying. This is the whole gospel. This is the reason for the Bible. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. This has been there all the time. Oh, tempers. So, brothers and sisters, we arrive at the fourth generation when? 1964, right? It, I'm going to show you now that in the fourth generation, we gave it up. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So, in the fourth generation, that hard. Stop beating. It stopped. In the fourth generation, that heart stopped beating. Now, what can the fourth generation pass on to the fifth generation? If the heart has stopped beating, if the central pillar of our faith it's no longer problem. We no longer believe we can have victory over sin. What is the purpose of a church? 
Are you with me, brothers and sisters? The new organization says, no, we don't, we don't need that. I'm going to show you this. So if God allows the fifth generation to come on the scene in 2024, what will they teach? What message will they have? It's gone. What will that be for them to give? What would be the purpose of coming to church? We'd just be like any other church. Don't you understand, saints, that God cannot allow this next generation to come on the scene, saints? Let's look. Let's see what has happened. Anybody know what that church is? Now, I'm just putting, I'm just using one. I, we could, man, I could go through so many of these, but we don't have time to go through a lot of them. Loma Linda University Church of Seventh-day Adventist. 7,000 members. You know who that man is? You know who he is? He's the senior pastor of that church. Now, I was intending to show you the whole skit that he, that he put out. Roy, you've seen it, haven't you? You've seen it too. Where he makes fun of the idea of having victory over sin. And the people are sitting there in the audience eating it up, lapping it down, sucking it like it's a good old smoothie. And he's not the only one. They all are doing this, brothers and sisters. All the pastors are doing this. All of them, they are scholarly. And he makes fun of M. L. Dries and said that he was defrocked for teaching this found generation theology. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Brother Chris sent this to me some time back. But they all, right here in Chattanooga, they're saying, look, we need to get rid of Ellen G. White. This big old church right here in Chattanooga. Our professors are teaching this. Our schools, all the schools are teaching this. So the, this, the poor students that's going to these schools and coming out, you notice they go in there on fire for the Lord, they come out, they're cold and dead, it's nothing. But brothers and sisters, don't you see that we have a work to do? Let's look at this thing. Randy Roberts. M. L. Driesen, field secretary of the General Conference in 1941 and 1950, he taught at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, now located at Andrews University from 1937 to 1949, and was recognized as a leading denomination of scholar on what? The atonement and related topics. This is what we believe and taught. He was professor of systematic theology. By this time, systematic theology had become the norm in our schools. Now he retires. Who we have on our right? A man by the name of Edward Hebenstall. His presentations on the law and covenants at the 1952 Bible Conference were highly influential upon the theology of the church. Hebenstall was responsible for what? A shift in the understanding of the church's investigative teaching. Who was responsible? Edward Hebenstall. So he was responsible for the shift that took place in our teachings. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? This is what M. L. Dresden taught. They found a demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future. Christ showed the way. He took a human body and in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow his example and prove that what God did in Christ, he can do in every human being who submits to him. Do you believe that, saints? Yeah, That's what this man taught. Was it, is it biblical what he taught? Have we proved this to you from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy? Amen. And now we know that it's true and that it must happen, and it must happen by when? Amen. Come on, brother and sister. Talk to me. It's plain. Can we, listen, do we need to reflect the image of Christ fully before we receive the seal? Yes. All right. Listen. And in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow his example and prove that what God did in Christ, he can do in every human being who submits to him. Let me speak to the camera. Those that are looking at this information by camera. This is no fairy tale. Brothers and sisters, get serious. Get serious. And let's finish this word. We must have victory over sin before 
the passing of the son law before that test. Are you with me? Listen, the world is awaiting this demonstration. When it has been accomplished, what's going to happen? The end will come. Listen, God will have fulfilled his plan. Let's read this last part together. He will have shown himself true and Satan a liar. His government will stand vindicated, brothers and sisters. Do we see it? Now, you pull up an ML and Drizzen book in, in a, in a, in a Seventh-day Adventist college today and see what's going to happen. You'll be thrown out. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? You go into a Seventh-day Adventist college today and talk about studying like we have been studying here, proof texting in, in the histor historicism method. You'll be thrown out. You see, saints, because the method that we have been using to study here is the method that proves the Bible and proves the truth and lets you arrive at truth. You can't, I'll show you tomorrow what method that they're using in the schools today and where it came from. 1952 Bible Conference, his presentation talking about uh, uh, heaven style, his presentation on the law and covenants at the 1952 Bible Conference were highly influential upon the theology of the church. Heaven style was responsible for a shift in the understanding of the church's investigative judgment teaching. Hebenstahl was the most influential scholar to come out against M. L. Adrian's found generation theology while upholding the pillar doctrines of the Adventist pioneers. He opposed Andreessen's form of historic Adventism on such issues as the human nature of Christ. See, he laid the foundation. And the he emphasized, as did question on doctrine, the atonement on the cross with a continuing ministry in heaven in the ancient temple. In other words, his, thought, his, his theology was it was finished at the cross. Jesus is there just applying what happened at the cross. In other words, we don't have to do anything. Once saved, always saved. He goes on to say that you cannot overcome sin, not even by the power of the indwelling Christ. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? The fact that Jesus was not just like other children of fallen Adam, I'm going to skip on down. This plainly shows up in heaven's, up in heaven's style's understanding of character perfection. Far from the ideas of sinlessness, perfectionism, the teaching that people must get to the place where they can stand without Christ and other ideas set forth by Andreessen, he argued that nowhere does the Bible equate perfection with sinlessness when speaking of the child of God. This is the man that became the influence, influence um, he became the man of the teaching of this, of this, of this school of this church. You need to read about him, what he, uh, his influence. He was the first to openly advocate no perfection in the believer until the second advent of Christ. I guess move on. I'm going to move on from that. You, you got enough of that. The prophet says, a law of the intellectual and spiritual worlds. It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding what happens, we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to which it is accustomed to have. Listen to Reverend. God told us never to go to the world to become educated, never to become accredited, never to uh, pattern our education after the education of the world. But in 1931, we went headlong into it. In 1940, all of our schools were accredited. So, saints, when you take a Adventist mind and an evangelical mind and you feed them the same education, what's going to happen? You're going to get the same results. And that's what happened. Through perverted educational system, you can't see it, through perverted educational processes, he is doing his utmost to obscure heaven's light. On the left, you have an evangelical mind. On the right, you have an SDA mind. But they both go to the same, they both get the education from the same system. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So when they get the education from the same system, brothers and sisters, they become just alike. Are you with me? And so that's what happened. By uniting with the world and partaking of his spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. So as we went to the world to become educated saints, our theology began to shift. 
So by 1952, things, it has shifted considerably, but by 1955, 57, things, it really has shifted. Hepmanstall just simply laid the foundation for the shift. On our left, we have Barnhouse. On our right, we have a man by the name of T.E. Unrod. T.E. Unrod was listening to a presentation by Barnhouse on righteousness by faith. Does Barnhouse know anything about righteousness by faith? No. But T.E. Unrod was really enjoying his presentation. He was beginning to believe this man have the light. But Barnhouse believes that once saved, always saved. We don't have to keep the law. He don't believe anything. But T.E. Unrod was moved by it and actually called or wrote the man, and, and Barnhouse rebuffed him and said, Look, who are you? You're a seven day Adventist talking about you. You understand you lack my presentation on righteousness by faith. He rebuffed him. But later on, Barnhouse and Martin were going to write a book. He, he, Martin had been commissioned to write a book and called The Kingdom of the Cults. And he was going to put Adventists in that book as a cult. But they remembered that UNRWA had contacted them, so they said, well, listen, let's give those Adventists an opportunity to explain what they believe. And so they went over and began to talk with the Adventists, and we began to deny everything that was fundamental to the doctrines of our faith. Everything they questioned us on, we said, oh, no, we don't believe that. And as, they, as we began to deny everything, they said, well, wait a minute now. Do you believe that Sunday has anything to do with the mark of the beast? And they said, no, we do not believe that. And then, but Martin was a very smart gentleman. He had already gone to the bookstore and had already purchased a book and had the book in his possession. So when they said, we don't believe that, he rolls out the book. He said, if you don't believe it, what about this book here? Their response, well, you know, in every denomination, some wide-eyed, the very worst, some wide-eyed lunatics gets in the print. But we do not endorse what's in that book. We don't endorse that. So they says, okay, if you don't believe any of this stuff, then we want you to write a book denying it all. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So we wrote a book, and the book is entitled Questions on Doctrine. Are you following me, brother and sister? What did the woman say? Books of a new order would come in. What did she say? Our religion would be changed. What did she say? The fundamental principles that sustain the work for the last 50 years would be counted as error. What did she say? Did she say this, brothers and sisters? Watch it. Watch it. Questions on doctrine. They say in the book on page six, what is it? Let me see the page. 650, that he took what? Sinless human nature. But that's 1,200 statements by our pioneers and 400 by, by the prophet herself said that he took sinful nature. Look what it says. When the incarnate God broke into human history and became one with the race, it is our understanding that he possessed the sinless of the nature with which Adam was created in Eden. This is in the book. She says books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. Continue on. As they were putting this book together, they began to send out pages of it to other thought leaders in the church. And they sent it out to a thought leader in Australia. And the Australian guy wrote back and said, listen, are you all trying to change our doctrines? Because the guy, when, they, when, he, when he read it, he said, wait a minute, that's not what we believe. So he wrote back to Anderson and said, look, are you trying to change our doctrine? What did Anderson write him back? Anderson wrote him back and said, yes, we are trying to change the doctrines, but we want to take it to the ministry before we go to the people with it. And you say, well, how did this guy find out all this? Anybody in here? I'm, I don't know if I should call his name. But there was a guy at the time that was working in the GC as a janitor. He was a student at the college, and he was working as a janitor at night. And every night, he had to clean Froome's office. And he began to notice these pages on Froome's desk every night. And he says that the Holy Spirit compelled him 
to start reading these drafts. He said, he felt funny. He said, I shouldn't be doing this. He said, but the Holy Spirit compelled him to read the drafts. So this student, whom everybody in here knows, read the whole thing from beginning to end. And that's the reason we have this information right now. I, will, I won't do it on camera, but I'll tell you his name off camera afterwards. I'll tell you what. There's a book you need to get by him. You can get it from me. You can get a whole case of them, dirt cheap. I won't, I'm trying to get them out to everybody. You can get a book from, by him called Evangelical Earthquake. <laughs> you need to get it. You can get 60 of them for about $30. So you can see we want to get them out. All right? Now, Anderson wrote him back and said, yes, we are trying to change the doctrine, but we want to take it to the minister before we go to the people. Didn't she say that our doctrine would be changed? In the Omega? Didn't she say it? All right, let's go. Our religion would be changed, the prophet said. Now, during this process, during our, our efforts, a young lady embraced the Adventist message, and her parents was upset. And they wrote to Martin, to Barnhouse, who was the, the, the top dog at the time, and says, our daughter have joined this cult, the Seventh-day Adventist church. What can we do? And this is what Barnhouse wrote him back. He then told the girl's parents, all this was in, what he was getting, he then told the girl's parents that he and Dr. Martin were working to bring Seventh-day Adventists into harmony with evangelical Protestantism by actually changing their doctrines, and he encouraged the couple with the assurance that he and Mr. Martin were succeeding. The principle of truth that God and his wisdom has given to the Roman church would be discarded. Satan saints that the enemy is the devil. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Look, let's go. Now, after all this was done, the, the, the people, the common people didn't know anything about what was going on. When it came out, M.L. Adrian found out about it. M.L. Adrian said, this is heresy. And M.L. Adrian began to try to contact the general conference and said, no, you can't do this. This is wrong. This is, what, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Spirit of Prophecy teaches. And they rebuffed him. And they defrocked him. Are you with me? Now, it's a long story. I can't get into all this. But he wrote a book called Letters to the Churches. You need a copy of it. Because you'll get the information on how the trans was taking place. The letters to the church. You need this. You need to understand this. Then Barnhouse, a minister magazine, blew the lid on what, was taking, what had been taking place behind cover for two years. After it was all, all, all over, we had written this book and we had made sure we saturated the Adventist people with it. Then Barnhouse and came out and, and they turned the magazine and began to explain what was happening because now Barnhouse is, is now embracing Adventism and the rest of the evangelical world is coming against him because no, they're a cult, they're a cult. But Barnhouse said, no, we have studied with them and they're no longer a cult. They believe as we believe. So he writes in his magazine, look what he says. Listen, listen at it now. A little less than two years ago, it was decided that Mr. Martin should undertake research in connection with Seventh-day Adventism. We got in touch with the Adventists saying that we wish to treat them fairly and would appreciate the opportunity of interviewing some of their leaders. The response was immediate and enthusiastic. We were enthusiastic to talk to the evangelicals. The position of the Adventists seemed to some of us in certain cases to be a new position. To them, it may be merely the position of the majority group of saying leadership, which is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold views divergent, divergent, divergent from, the, from that of the responsible leadership of the nomination. So they said, listen, it seems to us to be a new position. But they said, well, maybe it's not a new position. Maybe it's just the position that leadership have always held, and, but there was members in the church that held other views. But they're putting the brakes on them. Are you following me, brothers and sisters? Look what else he said. Listen now. You read it. Father, they do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Come on, let's go. But instead that he was carrying on a second mission work since 1844. This idea is also 
totally repudiated. Did the prophet say this would take place, saints? This is the Omega. Continue. They believe that since his ascension, Christ has been ministering the benefits of the atonement which, the, which, which he completed on the cross. Now, I used to have statements on that from Ellen G. White, but you already know this stuff now. This is the Omega. Brothers and sisters, this was in 1957. So this was what was carried over. When did the fourth generation start? 1964. So you see what the fourth generation inherited? And so the fourth generation, brothers and sisters, has carried this thing to the extreme. If God allows the fifth generation to come on the scene, what will they get? Don't you see that we have a work to do, brothers and sisters? Look what the prophet says. Those who follow in the light of the prophetic word saw that instead of coming to the earth at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ then entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of the atonement preparatory to his coming. That's what we believe as a people. In the typical system, which was a shadow of the sacrifice and priesthood of Christ, the cleansing of the sanctuary was the last service performed by the high priest in the year of the round administration. It was the closing work of the atonement, a removal of putting away of sin from Israel. It prefigured the closing work in the ministration of our high priest in heaven, in the removal of blotting out of the sins of his people, which are registered in the heavenly records. This service involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment, and it immediately precedes the coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Brothers and sisters, we are at the end. This is not a fairy tale. We are most definitely at the end. This is 2013. How many years is it to 2024? Now, I'm not, I'm, listen, don't leave here and say, Brother Mason, Brother David said Jesus coming in 2024. <laughs> but what are we seeing? When you see these signs, look up. Now, how, is that just one sign? How many signs have we been showing you? All of these things are dovetailing into one event, brothers and sisters. We are to look for the signs. We're to look for the events. We are at the end. Look at this statement. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not sin. Brothers and sisters, I want to say to you again and again and again that this is the crux of the matter. This is the issue that stands before us today. If we learn nothing else here in this school, please understand that by the power of the indwelling Christ, you and I can have total and complete victory over sin and that it must be done before we can receive the seal of the living God. Please understand this this day. I'm going to put this statement up here that Brother Davis quoted last time. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. You read the last part. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. The Bible tells us that they were called Christians at Antioch first. When they were first called Christians, it was not a popular name. It was a derogatory name. Oh, that's just them old Christians. Why? Because they look and act like Jesus. Oh, brothers and sisters, do you think it's time for us to look and act like Jesus? Do you believe it's time? Oh, brothers and sisters, I want to look and act like Jesus. 
But the only way I can look and act like Jesus is that Jesus must be in me. And so, saints, don't we see the necessity of having Christ in us? I've never seen it like on this wise before, brothers and sisters, how much we need Jesus. Is that blood rich? The Bible says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Saints, it's time for you and I to reach out and touch him. It's time for us to have that vital connection with Christ. We need to seek. Now, one of the things we need to do in seeking this, we need to bring our appetites into control. Is this a hard thing to do, saints? Here is a work that's come, going to come more closer and be more trying than anything you've ever had to overcome. Let's read one text and then we're going to close. Let's go to Romans. We're very, very familiar. I want to just get as much as I can. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, We're looking at verses 1. Verses 1 and 2, as a matter of fact. The Bible says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Ellen G. White tells us that the body should be servant to the mind and not the mind to the body. Continuing on in verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, saints, if Satan can get us to eat wrong, we, that mind cannot be renewed. We won't understand the word of God. We can't comprehend this precious truth, brothers and sisters. This, this thing with diet is so critical to our understanding and having this relationship with God that will allow us to overcome every other temptation of Satan. She says, here's a work that will come more close and be more trying than anything you've ever had to overcome. But if we can gain the victory here, we will have the more strength to overcome every other temptation of Satan. Brothers and sisters, it's time to finish the work. Let us pray. Father in heaven, in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, we ask you for this power. Help us to tap into this power. This power that will allow us to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. And though Satan has infiltrated and he's done so much to destroy and corrupt and to tear down, we know, Lord, that you have a nucleus of people that will stand true, and we want to be a part of that nucleus. Lord, we want to be able to stand on that sea of glass. We want to live with you eternally. And so, Lord, we ask you to empower us, to strengthen us. But, Lord, we know we cannot go by ourselves. There's a work to do. We need to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We ask a blessing upon each and every one of us, Lord, as we continue to study, prepare us that when we leave this place, we can leave with an unction. We can leave with a determination. We can leave equipped that we will be able to go and reach others with this precious truth. This truth has been laying before our very eyes all these years. But now, Lord, it's coming crystal clear to us. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together to study your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.